Baptist Church, and welcome to our weekly Bible study. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we ask that the Holy Spirit would guide and direct us into all truth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is now lesson number 80 in our ongoing series called Understanding the Jews. And tonight's title of the lesson is Dragging Saul to the Throne. And at the end of the lesson last week, we had left Saul and Samuel at the city limits of Zuf after Samuel had anointed Saul as king of Israel. But before Samuel sends Saul off to go back to his father, he knows that Saul still needs some assurance, some extra assurance. Samuel needs to put some additional steel in Saul's backbone. So Samuel begins to make this long list of prophecies. And he does that to, Samuel, to, Saul, to Saul privately, solely for his benefit. So I want to read that in the scriptures from 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 2 through 9. And the scripture reads, When thou art departed from me today, then thou shalt find two men by Rachel's sepulchre in the border of Benjamin at Zelzah. And they will say unto thee, The asses which thou wentest to seek are found. And lo, thy father hath left the care of the asses and sorroweth for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Then shalt thou go on forward from thence, and thou shalt come to the plain of Tabor. And there shall meet three young men going up to God to Bethel, one carrying three kids, and another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine. And they will salute thee, and give thee two loaves of bread, which thou shalt receive of their hands. After that thou shalt come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines, and it shall come to pass when thou art come thither to the city, that thou shalt meet a company of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tabret and a pipe and a harp before them, and they shall prophesy. And the Spirit of the Lord will come upon thee, and thou shalt prophesy with them, and shalt be turned into another man. And let it be, when these signs are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. And thou shalt go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down unto thee to offer burnt offerings, and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. Seven days shalt thou tarry till I come to thee, and show thee what thou shalt do. And it was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. Can you see what Samuel was doing? Saul was scared. He knew that the people could have seen his appointment as an insult. And perhaps... In a state of rage, they may have killed him on the spot. And additionally, you may have picked up that in the fifth verse of Samuel 10, there was a Philistine garrison in Bethel. And that is where Saul met that company of prophets. Israel was still under occupation. And the first thing that the Philistines would want to have done when hearing about the appointment of a new king, would be to immediately take him out. So, knowing Saul's concerns, Samuel methodically outlines everything that's going to happen to Saul throughout the rest of that day. And he didn't talk in generalities as a lot of false prophets do. No, Samuel was very specific. And he prophesied the coming events in a detailed way. In fact, Samuel went somewhat overboard in including all of the five W's 
uh, and the apes, who, what, where, when, why, and how. And you can go back and reread those first 10 verses in chapter 10 if you didn't already pick up on that. But four of the five W's and the how are all provided by Samuel for the express purpose of the why. And we'll get to the why in just a minute. Uh, but before Samuel lets Saul go, he tells him that before the day is out, everything that he just prophesied is going to take place. But what was the purpose? What was the purpose of all that detailed prophecy? What is the why? Well, let's go back and reread verse 7. 1 Samuel 10 and verse 7. The scripture reads, And let it be, when these things, or after all these things, <clears throat> are come unto thee, that thou do as occasion serve thee, for God is with thee. Samuel tells Saul that after he has experienced the fulfillment of every one of those prophecies that he foretold, that the effect on Saul should be a galvanization, if you will, of his confidence. That he should then be ready to step up to the plate and do whatever the occasion calls for. Namely, to understand that God was with him, to stop doubting, and to start acting like the new man that God has now made him. And sure enough, things happened just as Samuel predicted. Saul was surely impressed, he had to be, uh, but even after that, our man Saul was still not ready for prime time. So Saul finally makes it back to the land of Benjamin. And it isn't clear whether he went directly to his father's home or to his uncle's house. But in any event, his first report, recorded conversation in the scriptures was with his uncle. And I want to look at that in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 14 through 16. The scripture reads, and Saul's uncle said unto him and to his servant, Whither went ye? And he said, To seek the asses. And when we saw that they were nowhere, we came to Samuel. And Saul's uncle said, Tell me, I pray thee, what Samuel said unto you. And Saul said unto his uncle, He told us plainly that the asses were found. But of the matter of the kingdom, Whereof Samuel spake, he told him not. So, Saul says that while he was out looking for the asses, he ran into the prophet Samuel. Really? Now that got his uncle's attention. Keeping in mind that Saul running into Samuel was like a Catholic running into the Pope. His uncle was all over it. He says, well, what did he say? What did Samuel say to you? Saul replies, well, we couldn't find my father's asses, but Samuel told me that they had been found, and I was able to get them back. Talk about half-truths. Now, it is true that Saul's mission, when he left home, was to find those asses. But I ask you, was that the biggest news to report? Found a bunch of donkeys, or, oh yeah, Samuel anointed me king of Israel. Never mentioned that, just a small detail. But he didn't mention it because he was still struggling with his new role. Too much, too fast. Saul was a little overwhelmed. But things were about to get just a little bit more tense for Saul. Guess where Samuel decides to gather all the people together to make the big announcement about who this new king was going to be? 
Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 17. Scripture reads, And Samuel called the people together unto the Lord to Mizpah. So Samuel gathers the people to Mizpah. And that seems to be a place from which Samuel often operated from. But it holds, oh yes, special significance for its connection to Saul's tribe. We just finished a couple weeks ago studying about what happened there. Let's go back to Judges and just read one verse in chapter 20, the first verse. Judges 21. Scripture reads, <clears throat> Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was gathered together as one man, from Dan even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead, unto the Lord in Mizpah. Mizpah is the place where Israel had gathered together to make war against whom? Benjamin, Saul's tribe. And Mizpah is the very place, the same place, where Israel made an oath not to allow any of their daughters to intermarry with the tribe of Benjamin. That's how much they were despised. Let's look at Judges 21 and verse 1. Scripture reads, Now the men of Israel had sworn in Mizpah, saying, There shall not any of us give his daughter unto Benjamin to wife. Those events were not all that long ago. And the crowd gathered together there in Mizpah would have been well aware of what had taken place there. And those memories would have been the last thing that Saul would have wanted them thinking about when Samuel put him in front of them. So with that in mind, I think we should have maybe a little more sympathy for Saul in how the events unfold. Samuel starts the proceedings that day with a speech, and his words are not very flattering to his audience. He's not exactly warming up the crowd. Essentially, he says to them, you're all a bunch of ungrateful sinners. After all that God has done for you, your response is to reject him and insist that I give you a king. You want a king to rule over you instead of God. So be it. So Samuel tells the people to present themselves in front of him by tribe. Now let's suppose that you and I are in that crowd. What are we thinking? This is it. Uh, this is what we've been waiting for. We're finally about to get our king. Who's it going to be? Which tribe is going to be taken? Probably thinking one of the big tribes like Judah or Manasseh. But I hope it's my tribe, right? The anticipation, the excitement, I would have been running pretty high. And then comes the call. Let's go to the scriptures. 1 Samuel 10 and verse 20. The scripture reads, And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. Talk about a buzzkiller. Wait, what? What did he say? Benjamin. You've got to be kidding me. Benjamin? Samuel continues winnowing down the people of Benjamin until he gets to Saul's family and then finally to Saul himself. How much murmuring do you think is going through that crowd? Benjamin? Saul? Who is this man, Saul? Well, 
Well, Saul himself surely didn't think that things were going all that well, because he hid. Perhaps he thought if he didn't show himself, well, maybe Samuel would pick somebody else. We have no way of knowing that, but we do know that Saul was exceedingly reluctant to step forward. In fact, when Saul did not present himself, the question was raised as to whether or not they should continue to wait on him. They didn't know where he was, and essentially they began to ask God, well, what should we do? Where is this man? So let's read what happened. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 21 through 27. The scripture reads, When he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was taken, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. And when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further if the man should yet come thither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. And they ran and fetched him thence. And when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. <clears throat> and Samuel said to all the people, See ye him whom the Lord hath chosen that there is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted and said, God save the king. Then Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel went all, I'm sorry, and Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. And Saul also went home to Gibeah. And there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. But the children of Belial said, How shall this man save us? <clears throat> and they des despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. So, in response to their inquiry about Saul's location, God tells them where he is hiding. Now, there had to be a fair amount of mystery and skepticism and surely curiosity running through the people while they were waiting for their new king to make his appearance. But once Saul was brought before them, there was an immediate change. Samuel tells the people, take a good look at this man. This man whom God hath chosen. And so they do. And what they see is a magnificent physical specimen. Good looking, strong, head and shoulders above everyone else who was present. Now we are talking about an event that was over 3,000 years ago. But one thing has not changed. And it's no different today. And it doesn't matter what walk of life you're in. It could be entertainment, athletics, academia, even business. If you are a beautiful person, you have what is referred to as the it factor. You're going to have a leg up on everybody else. Based on nothing more than your fabulous appearance. And Samuel plays right into their vain perceptions. He says, essentially, can you find anyone else in Israel, anyone else in Israel, who looks the part more than this man? The answer had to be no. Who else would want to lead the nation, or who else would want anyone other than this man to lead the nation into battle? Of course, there was no one else who could compete with Saul's appearance. And so the people called out, Yiki HaMalek, or long live the king. Or in some translations, it's interpreted, God saved the king. A phrase that's still used 
in the British monarchy today. Right down to the present time. Long live the king, or in Elizabeth's case, long live the queen. That's where the saying comes from, right here in 1 Samuel 10, 24. So the people are mostly mollified, uh, won over by the imposing physical appearance of Saul. And they seem to be largely in acceptance of the man Samuel has brought before them. And I say largely because there were still some naysayers. And we found them in that last verse that we read in the chapter. They said, quote, how shall this man save us? They were still hung up on Saul's lack of a tribal pedigree. Their comment could be rephrased as, how can this low down Benjamite save us? They were not impressed. And Saul heard those comments. We know he did because the very last sentence of the chapter tells us that he held his peace. He didn't respond to their disparaging comments. He kept his mouth shut. When the prophet Samuel sent the crowd away, Saul did not go about setting up his kingdom. He simply went back home, went back to his father's house. What does that tell us about Saul? It tells us that at that time, Saul was still a humble man, a man that did not see himself above his people. Now, that attitude was going to take a change, but not yet. Not on that day. Now we're soon going to get into the event that compelled Saul to begin embracing his position as the leader of Israel. But first, we need to focus on the relationship that he has already established between himself and Samuel. And we need to do that because Saul's thoughts about Samuel and the effects of his relationship with Samuel would never leave him. Saul was always aware that Samuel was God's prophet. He saw firsthand how God gave Samuel the ability to see both the past and the future. He personally experienced how Samuel exposed his own thoughts and had understanding about his undertakings. It was Samuel who, against all human logic, chose him out of all the people of Israel and anointed him king. And it was Samuel who brought the people together at Mizpah and who made the case for him to hold such a high office. Now, without question, Saul ultimately owed his kingship to God. But when it comes to men, Saul knew that there was no one else other than Samuel to whom he owed so much. Neither did he know of any other man who could speak for the God of heaven, as did Samuel. But as Saul began to settle in as king, into his role as king, it wasn't long before a love-hate relationship began to emerge. Yes, Saul was king, but he wasn't truly sovereign. He never felt like he could act in an unfettered way. There was always Samuel in the back of his mind, and he began to resent the need to get Samuel's approval concerning the affairs of state. And as you go through Saul's life, as presented to us in the scriptures, that tension is not hard to see. 
I suppose we could say that Saul's appreciation for Samuel hit rock bottom when he killed all the priests, save one, from the city of Nob. Then he wiped out their families. Those priests were all descendants of Aaron. And listen, some of them from Eli. Eli, the man under whom Samuel began his ministry. Of course, that incident is down the road somewhat, and we'll get there eventually. But I want to go over the very first incident that elevated Saul from his father's house in Benjamin to the throne in Jerusalem. So let's go back to the scriptures. And I want to look at 1 Samuel chapter 11 now in the very first verse. The scripture reads, Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said unto Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve thee. So, according to this verse, the time of this attack on Israel by the Ammonites coincided with the time that Saul returned home to his father's house after being presented as king in Mizpah. Right away, a crisis occurs that will require a response. Nahash the Ammonite came against Jabesh Gilead and laid siege unto it. So let's put some location on this city. I want to show you Exhibit 106. Now there are a couple of dialogue boxes on here that you can ignore. That was really attached to a previous lesson. But if you look at the slide, you can see at the end of that red line uh, that goes up towards the top of the slide and then veers right. But right at the end of that line is Jabesh Gilead, which is on the east side of the Jordan River. This was the city that was destroyed for not participating in the war against who? Benjamin and from whom Israel obtained wives for the Benjamite survivors of that war. Meaning what? Meaning that King Saul was a descendant of one of those women. So, clearly by the time of Saul, that city had been rebuilt and repopulated ostensibly by the surrounding citizens of Gad because it was in the territory of Gad. But, when it looked like the people of the city would starve to death because of the siege, the Israelite citizens made a request for peace from the Ammonites. They said, if you'll spare the city, we will surrender, and we'll also be your servants. Now that seems to be the kind of offer that would almost always be accepted. We were Ammonites, why wouldn't we? You get the city without any further loss of men or treasure. And you also get all the citizens as slaves. So the Ammonites give them an answer. But it was not the answer that the Israelites were expecting. Let's look at it in 1 Samuel chapter 11, verse 2. And the scripture reads, And Nahash the Ammonite answered them, On this condition will I make a covenant with you, that I may thrust out all your right eyes and lay it for a reproach upon all Israel. Wow. So, Nahash... The leader of the Ammonites says, okay, we'll honor your offer of peace on one condition, that you voluntarily allow us to remove the right eye from every one of you. Say what? 
This answer makes it clear, clear as a bell, that Nahash was looking for something more than just surrender. And he makes it plain at the end of the verse. His purpose in making this ghastly proposal was bigger than Jabesh Gilead. He wanted to do something that was right in Israel's face. Something that would be an embarrassing reproach to the entire nation. His purpose was bigger than just Jabesh Gilead. You remember back a few weeks ago, <clears throat> we talked about <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the Philistines putting out the eyes of Samson. And we discussed the reasons why people of antiquity would employ that particular form of torture. And among those reasons was revenge or humiliation. Well, that seems to be central to the motivation behind the response of this Ammonite Nahash. Keeping in mind that when Israel first came into that part of the country, they put a pretty good whipping on the Ammonites. That was when Israel was on its way to the Promised Land under Joshua. That kind of thing doesn't get forgotten. But now, the great bulk of Israel had long since crossed over the Jordan and were settled into their new cities and towns. Would the Israelites now come back to the east bank to fight for this town? If you remember, that very same issue was raised in reverse at the time of Joshua, when he first took the people over. And Joshua ordered that the tribes that stayed on the east bank were not allowed to settle in until they fought alongside of the other tribes to secure the inheritance on the West Bank. And so, it would be a great shame and reproach if now that the shoe was on the other foot, that the tribes on the other side of Jordan would not come to help their brothers. And the facts show, unfortunately, that up until the time that Nahash made that ultimatum, oh, the Israelites had not come. They had not yet shown up. Jabesh Gilead had been under siege long enough for the people that were inside the city under siege to feel that all was lost, that they were at the point of starvation. Yet in all that time, they had received no help from the rest of Israel. Now the timing of this Ammonite attack was no coincidence. It happened at the same time that Israel was supposedly naming this new king. But after the announcement, this new king went back to where he came from, some king. And based on that, the Ammonites reasonably, reasonably thought that Saul was not up to the job. So at this time of seeming vulnerability, the Ammonites saw their chance to not only take out the city of Jabesh Gilead, but to add a great reproach and humiliation to the nation at large. And to them, the humiliation of Israel was the bigger prize. So what did the people of Jabesh Gilead do? How did they respond to this so-called offer of peace? Would they agree to literally give up their right eye? Or would they choose to die of starvation? Well, Lord willing, we're going to get the answer to that question next week. So please remember to pray for all those on our prayer list. Until we get together again, shalom.